and welcome back to Back to the Beginning. Today we are joined by Frank Cottrell Boyce, who is no stranger to CMC. Frank returns um, and he was one of our most popular keynotes back at the CMC in 2013, where you talked about writing the opening ceremony for the 2012 Olympic Games in London. A job that doesn't come along often and was a result of your collaboration with Danny Boyle um, and your Carnegie Award winning novel Millions, which he um, made into a movie. You've written several movies and your latest has just won the British Animation Award for Writing. Congratulations on behalf of myself and all of us at CMC. And I think that that brings us back to back to the beginning. Um, so let's go back and see how everything started. Looking back as a child, did anything influence you or inspire your career today? Um, I think I spent a lot of time in the library is the first thing. We lived in a uh, mum, my dad and my brother and I lived with my grandmother in a two bedroom flat and she had one of the bedrooms. So <laughs> I don't know how they coped, but I think to escape, my mum spent a lot of time in the library in Kirkdale and Liverpool. So I think there was that, that was a big thing that we spent a lot of time in the library. And I associated the library with somewhere that was more peaceful and more glamorous than the house. It was a safe space. It was very beautiful. Um, it was quiet. It was lovely. It was comfy. So I think that the love of stories came from from that, from my mum, really. And also from my, my two grands, who were both very um, garrulous, very good at telling stories. So storytelling was always there. So you grew up with storytelling. Was there any was there any like books in particular um, from being? In the yeah, there life? was like this. This is a very empowering thing. But I remember getting um, where the wild things are out of the library mm -hmm. and being absolutely blown away by it. And then taking it back to the library, never seeing it again and kind of coming to the conclusion that I dreamed that book. So I was so I'd written it. So I was, <laughs> I spent years thinking, I'm going to get that, I'm going to write that down, I'm going to do those drawings, it's going to be, yeah. you know, it's going to make a lot of money, going to be famous uh, with that book. And then um, going to school and finding a copy in the school library and thinking, damn. So would you, would you say that that process and being in the library and being surrounded by storytelling through your grands and your mum, did that in, that in, inspire you? When do you do you remember like a conscious decision of oh I could do writing could be something that I do when I'm older? No, yeah, kind of. I kept like in year six, I had a really good friend all the way through primary, and we were those two boys who just sat at the back and class and chatted. And then in year six, he was off sick, and I really missed him. And I think he was. I mean, he was off sick for a long time, and. So out of that kind of loneliness, really, I, I, I really threw myself into a piece of schoolwork. And uh, at the end of the lesson, the teacher collect, collected it. And she looked very taken aback. <laughs> she had that kind of, how the hell did this come out of you face on? And she went to the front of the class and she did this amazing thing, which I'm always telling teachers about. She read it out loud. And hearing a grown up read my words, I can still very clearly remember thinking, oh, you can be good at words. So mm -hmm. there were people in my class who were good at football or good at drawing or good at netball or good at maths. There was a boy in my class who was very good at beating up other children. Um, and that thinking that words can be something you could be good at. So not thinking I'll be a writer because I didn't know that was a thing, but thinking, oh, words are something that you can watch the way people watch football with a bit of detail and choosing that was a better word and that was a less good word. And also thinking, I mean, and I'm always taken back to that moment, like no matter how big or famous the actor is reading my words out in a movie, I will always remember Sister Paul in year six at that moment, you know, at a read through, whatever. It's like, wow, I'm back in year six. Um, and, but also thinking, oh, maybe when you, I think at some other level thinking, maybe when you see people, being funny or witty in a movie, they're not making it up as they go along. Mm -hmm. So I can tell you exactly who the first writer I noticed was, and it wasn't a book writer. The first writer I noticed was Eddie Braben, who wrote mm -hmm. all the scripts for Mockham and Wise. I oh, remember watching yeah. the Mockham and Wise show and thinking, oh, there's a writer. They're not making that up. He's, he's yeah. writing that down. So I was very interested in Eddie Braben, who turned out to be from Liverpool and living in Liverpool and a famous gag writer, he wrote for 
Ken Dodd and Bob Monkhouse and Bob Hope and all these people. You obviously credit such inspirational teachers and um, reading. Was was it hard to keep the drive alive for um, writing after school, or did you? Where, what was your journey like after you? No, it? by the end of school, like in sixth form, I was like, we were doing. We had a kind of dissident school magazine, like a school magazine that we produced ourselves. Um, we I, like it, it was a satirical. It was anti our own school, although. The, I now realised that we were tolerated, but I thought we were kind of getting away with it. And that it was sort of punk rock time, so it went straight into, I went straight from that into doing fanzines um, yeah. and hanging out in Eric's nightclub and handing out a fanzine and, and yeah. writing bits for other people's fanzines. So the fanzines were like bands, really. Um, mm -hmm. So it went straight to that. And so that I think the strong thing for me was that I'd had a lot of experience of not writing for teachers, that sounds yeah. disparaging, but and, and it was a teacher who started me, but that thing of writing for your peers or writing for your interest group rather than writing for marks, yeah. if that makes sense. So what happened after school? Yeah, I went to university, and at university I was, like, at the end of my first term I was putting plays on and reviews and doing little bits of stand-up and things like that. So there was plenty of scope for doing that. Again, I'd sort of taken the model from being around Liverpool at the height of kind of post-punk Eric's. So that whole thing of like do it yourself, that ethic yeah. of do it yourself, which I still am very drawn to people who do it themselves. So like my all time creative hero would be Oliver Postgate and Peter Furman, who made mm -hmm. Log in the Nog and Bagpuss. And they just yeah. did it. They just did it in a barn with a camera, mm -hmm. you know, they just did it themselves. So that whole kind of do it yourself thing was very inspiring to me. And I'm, I mm -hmm. still kind of, I'm very drawn to that ethic. Yeah, it must have been so like culturally enriching as well because the culture of Liverpool at the time and the music scene and everything seems to have really inspired you and your writing as well. And that crossover, the fact that, you know, creativity is creativity, whether that means yeah. you're writing songs in a band or making posters for that band or writing about the band or painting sets in the theatre. There are a lot of people from the Everyman there making costumes, that whole, it, which is like a, a movie set or a TV, making a TV thing, that you're all creative, including, you know, the caterers, the accountants. That's all, that all goes to one act of creativity. What, what was it like? Because you'd, you, obviously this is for the Children's Media Conference. Did you start writing for a different audience? Obviously, right, you've written for adults as well. What was it like, that transition of writing for, and why why write for children when you obviously had a successful career writing for um, a dip, like a wider audience? Yeah, that was kind of a conversion experience for me. Um, I I mean, I, I started by writing soap opera and it was just, I mean, I had kids, you know, I, 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 we, had, we got married quite young and had a child quite young. So I started writing soap opera for a living and got kind of drawn into the world of film which I love, and I still love making films. But um, when a couple of things happened that kind of made me think, well, really the things that I owe myself, to, not just my creativity, but my kind of, my ability to be happy, yeah. um, was from reading books, from being read to, from having books read to me on Jack and Ori or dramatised, yeah. um, and everything that came from a lot of stuff that came through children's television, which was which really really fed me, um, whether that was like a magazine show like Blue Peter or, or as I said, Jack and Ori or, you know, cartoons, that that they were the places that I was going to, to recover my own happiness when I wasn't happy, and thinking well that, helping to build the apparatus of happiness, is the most important thing you know, and consolation and speaking to those children who are not skill-shaped. Um, yeah. So I can't, it was like an active decision to start writing for children, although it was books rather than films. Yes. It's very hard to make a children's film in this country. Yeah, why do you think that is? Well, because you can't send a child up the red carpet in a fancy frock. <laughs> you know, it's as simple as that, really. You know? Um, you know, if you've got... You know, a good children's film's got child leads. It's, and very hard. I mean, it's like that. You mentioned millions in the the introduction. I think it took about eight yeah. years to get anyone interested in making that film. Wow. Mm -hmm. yeah. Obviously, you we've kind of spoke about 
that and you hinted at that um, just in that previous question but do you think there was any points that you found it was tough and that you thought you wouldn't make it you thought that this was not going to maybe work out as a career and um, what kind of got you through that that um, if you if if I mean it, it, it just is tough <laughs> it, yeah. it is tough and people fall off the you know I feel very blessed that I've been allowed to sit at the table for so long already um, but you know, making films and television is just—it just is really difficult. So many things have to be in the right place for it to get made at all, and so many more things have to be in place for it to be half decent, and for it to be really good. I mean, like, <laughs> I mean, really, genuinely, you need every god on Olympus <laughs> on your side, really. It's like a jigsaw puzzle where all the pieces have to fit. <laughs> yeah. And, and all have to fit together at the right, time. At the right yeah. moment. Yeah, they've all got to be in the right place, but also at the right time. Uh, yeah. And then be seen by the right people. So, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, it's three-dimensional jigsaw puzzles in the, the time-space yeah. matrix. <laughs> do you think, when do you think that there was a moment in your career, maybe in your earlier career or in the middle of your career, that you felt like, it was like that sort of iconic I made it moment or a moment of like, yeah, I'm actually really good at this and this is my purpose and what I was meant to do. Haven't heard it. That? <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> Haven't heard that. I felt very happy that Ken's Case Kingdom won an award because yeah. my first love was animation and I just never found my way into it until then. Um, yeah. And um, yeah, I, I, like my, the first things that excited me were, I, I think I just said, Oliver Postgate. And if I had my life over again, I'd try harder to do that. Uh, so finally to have made an animated film, even though it's a world away from Bagpuss and Clangers, yeah. is still, that feels great to me. I feel really, ah, finally. Got my name on yeah. that, you know. Congratulations again on the award for Kent's Case Kingdom. What was it like? What was the process like making that and um, making the animation? Uh, it just took forever. It's the answer, you know. <laughs> I, I'm embarrassed to tell you when I wrote the first draft of that because um, it's like a very straightforward story. You know, and you would think the elements were clear. It's a desert island. There's an old man and a young boy. Uh, there's lots of animals. I mean, really, the mixture is very strong, but it just took so long to get the finance together for that. For me, the exciting thing was that when Kirk and Neil, who directed it, came on board. Um, well, first of all, it, you know, Sarah Radcliffe and Camilla Deacon, who produced it, were heroic in their endurance. Um, but when Neil and Kirk came on board, that was like going to film school for me because the storytelling was so so different, and so it was so enriching. So, if, I mean, this is not a disrespect to Michael's book at all because I've given my life to that, a big chunk of my life to dramatising it. But quite a chunk of that book is sort of set up. You know, it's like, well, how are they on this boat? This, it's, it's the story is a family's on a sailing ship, the sailing ship gets wrecked, the kid gets marooned on an island. And quite a lot of the beginning of that book is explaining how this very ordinary family happened to be on a sailing ship. And when Neil and Kurt came on board, it like, so we'll start with the ship setting out. It was like, oh yeah, you can do that. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need any of that it's just like here they are and you'll know what they're like by seeing them and listening to them and you don't need the story of how they got there I think maybe you do in a book but you definitely don't in an animated film the first storyboard that they showed me I can remember really clearly began with the anchor coming out of the, the ground and following yeah. the anchor up onto ship which the, the film doesn't do that now but um that was kind of amazing to me. It was like that was like going to film school. Yeah. Do you have a preference writing for screen or writing novels? I, I mean, writing a children's book is murderously mm. difficult compared to writing a screenplay. But yeah. having written a children's book, yeah, <laughs> is a lovely feeling. 
and you, and you get to be the I get to be the screen because as a children's writer, I go to schools and I read it out and do the voices and perform it. And, and for the Wonder Brothers, my new one, I'm literally doing magic tricks. So you are the cinema for that. So that's very exhausting, but also really rewarding. And you can see, you can see instantly the reactions. Making a movie is like writing a movie is very easy <laughs> by comparison. But getting a movie made is very difficult by comparison. So mm-hmm. it's much easier to get a book yeah. published than it is to get a film made. But it's much harder to write a book than it is to write a movie. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my final question. We've looked back to the beginning and now we're going to look forward. Um, what, would you, what would you say to the new generation coming into writing um, and children's writing in particular? Um, if it's not, if it doesn't offer hope, and it doesn't offer joy, then then what is it? <laughs> you know, yeah. It's like I, for me, it's like pessimism and dystopia are the luxuries of good times. This is not a good time, and you need to be pointing the way. You need to be finding those little tiny sparks of hope and blowing on them. I think that's what I think that's what the job is. I do. Thank you so much for speaking to us today and thank you for taking part in Back to the Beginning.